Hi, I'm Ed Parco, your host of Inner Edison, and today I'm with Kurt Cusino. I said that wrong again, didn't I? Cusino, but close enough. Cusino, Cusino. I'll get there. We got like 30 some minutes. I'll figure it uh, out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you All a few right, more so, shots. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So we were talking before we got on air and we we're talking about a bunch of stuff where we came from, where we lived before. Um, you're you're currently in Oceanside. Um, I'm in Northern California. I used to be down in that area for many, many years before it changed. Um, my listeners aren't going to really know much about you or your company is Hyper Life Brands, correct? Hype Life. Hype Life. Hype Brands. Life. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I threw an R in there, didn't I? I'm it's messing okay. up on names all day today. <laughs> so let's talk a little about yourself and then we'll talk about your company. All right. Sure, sure. Uh, again, my name is Kurt Cushino, and I grew up actually in the Midwest, even though I'm in Oceanside, California, Southern California, to those who aren't familiar with the lay of the land here. Um, so I, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I went to a, a private Christian school my whole life. I was an only child. Um, and so I had a lot of, I guess you could say free time, but I also had a, my, my father was very, uh, big on hard work and being a constant student and doing a finishing the job and what does a finished job really look like? And, uh, he, I think he really helped him and my mother, you know, really helped set me up for success, but I had this entrepreneurial spirit in me since the at the youngest age and so i i did things i won't bore you with all of them but i had a greeting card business when i was i don't even remember how young i was i could have been 10 or 11 because i was fooling around on a like a old monochrome computer like a trs 80 so i would design these cards and then print them out on the those butterfly remember those butterfly printers with the the dots yes. on the sides yeah so i would print them out fold them up and then I'd sell them to my family and friends and all that. And then I got into music at a very, very young age and started creating. And as soon as I started to learn and, you know, I took things like classical guitar lessons and then I was in bands and then I was doing electronic music and, you know, booking studio time. I was booking studio time and playing shows live and making posters and designing things before I could ever even drive a car. Um, and so that entrepreneurial spirit just kind of carried me to where I am today. Um, you know, I'm a child of the eighties and so I grew up on the, on the tech curve there right. to get to Before work. you get, I, I want to go back to the trash eighties, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, now you, you just brought up my childhood, right? I was, you know, okay. that's basically where I grew up on. I remember when I got in the service down there, um, we, I was in physical therapy and you have to do this machine. I was talking about the other day, we had to put a five and a quarter inch floppy in to get it yes. to work. You know, I remember, and, and those. Went, remember those. And then you had those yeah. you know, 286, 386, 486 and all this stuff afterwards and then all that. But I want to get back to how did you get the spirit? Was that did your family own a business? Actually, no. Spirit? I mean, how did that come? No. How was that brought out in you? I mean, because not most people aren't born with that usually. Yeah, I don't. that's a good question. Uh, I for a couple things about me. So I'm a I'm a left and right brain thinker. I'm a whole brain thinker. Um, and I think I come from a long line of engineers. So there's a okay. lot of heavy engineering side, you know, not necessarily socially graceful all the time, but very, very smart. I mean, all the way back up, you know, my grandfather, my dad, my uncle, um, just a bunch of engineers in my family. So there was always this, that kind of work ethic, I think that that requires and also the, the technical side of things. And so even when I was, I don't remember what age, maybe like 12 or 13, you know, my dad, I remember one time my dad, you know, so we're trying to figure out what I'm going to do for the summer. So he like threw me a programming book, like how to learn to program basic or something like that. So I played around with it. Um, and I was like, yeah, I, you know, I get it. Uh, and then I was, I was on the computer a lot because that was like the early days. I'm talking CompuServe. Mm -hmm. I remember those five and a half inch discs before we went to three and a half. I mean, I had, mm -hmm. I remember I used to play, um, Chuck Yeager's flight simulator, which I yep. bought and you got the discs and you, you put it in and you had to wait for it to all wind up. And then I also played Ab Abrams battle tank was another, another one, all tank, just yellow and screen color. Like that's it. Just <laughs> so yeah. kids so got getting... lucky these days. I tell you, yeah, they have right? no idea how lucky they have it. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. I have a five and a three-year-old and they're, they're just starting. The three-year-old is 
better at my Nintendo Switch than my five-year-old just because he's spending more time with them. I'm just amazed because just the amount of buttons that's on a controller today. Like there's a huge difference between, you know, I grew up with the Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, you know, and like when Sega Genesis came out, that was that was crazy that I had, you know, I believe I had four buttons on it. So yeah, there's a lot we could talk about in the 80s. Yeah, well, that's, I, I'm sure they want more to know about you than what we know about computers and how bad we had it. Right? Yeah, but I, I, as far as, as you, are you born with that entrepreneurial spirit? I think it's an amazing question. I don't know. Um, for me, it just it's always been a natural drive. It's not something that I had to think about. Or There's a lot of articles about being an entrepreneur, becoming an entrepreneur. And I think at the end of the day, I would say, you either are or you aren't. It, it's not a, I'm going to learn, I'm going to read and I'm going to study and become this. Like you either have this sort of internal drive that makes you, enables you to be, it's like a superpower. It enables you to be self-led. Um, and if you can't lead yourself and be a self-starter, and as I said, you know, earlier, and I say this all the time, like I, to this day, um, I'm a, I'm a few decades old. <laughs> I'm between a few and, and that other. We got gotcha. you. Well, we yeah, know but, you, what you're talking about. Everybody knows your age, right? So yeah. So, uh, you know, I've always had that that feeling, and I think with you know with my agency because we work a lot with startup founders and entrepreneurs and people who I call them you know basically visionaries when we're talking about the startup side of of who we work with. They just have it, you know, there's never any, you know, questioning of it. Now, also being an entrepreneur and, and to this day, I feel like I, I, I'm still an entrepreneur too, because I built a business that is now uh, just about, uh, this would be our 20th year, actually. Um, I started it in 2001. So 20 years, uh, which is kind of crazy to me to think, but, and I've spun off other little things along the way too, but you know, the, the people and myself, like, you know, you just have it, but at the same time, it can be, sometimes it can be, you know, a lonely place. It can be tough. You, you, I, I think I, I listened to one of your other podcasts and there was something about not knowing what the rules are because you're making them. I think it was the one with uh, Nick. Right. If I got that right. So like, yeah, you know, you're kind of making up the rules, but when you have a business, it needs to serve a purpose, you know? So you're kind of defining that, that rule set. And the more that, you know, um, I'm thankful that I have that left and right brain, whole brain systems thinker capability, the, the engineering and the creative side. And, you know, I've moved that into, you know, brand and business strategy um, development, you know, like those things coming together all together just makes it almost in my world kind of gives me and the people I surround myself with on my team kind of enables us to to be the perfect storm for our ideal type of clients, you know, so. Now, so 20 years, how did you start? I mean, it's, I don't, let me try one more thing first. Uh, all right. So I, I mean, I'm so there's, we're so connected on this because I mean, I start. I've owned my own multiple companies for multiple times. My family mm -hmm. was not an entrepreneurial family. I mean, my grandparents had a dairy, so I guess somewhat, but that was just because it's the family business. Right. And I worked yeah. on that one summer and said, this is not for me. You know, I worked on their weekends. This is not what I want to do. I'm out of here. But my, my dad worked for Ma Bell. My mom, you know, didn't do that. So I can see how what you're talking about where it's just something you want to do. For me, I've always I want, thought I wanted to go in the medical field then realized I didn't like that in the Navy and go, I want to be in business because that's where you can do this, this, this and this. And I, I can see how they can be how you're talking, what you're talking about, because some on in some engineers don't want that. Right. They're, mm -hmm. they're like, I want to work for somebody. I want to focus on this. I want to take risks. Yeah. This is not what I do. I'm an engineer. I figure out things. That's all I do. Right. And then right. you're saying I'm an engineer, but I also have this other side that's very creative. And what can I do with that? Right. Exactly. Yeah. There was a time where um, I do remember my dad did do consulting. So I shouldn't say I don't know anyone, but I, I always felt like it was just a stopgap between his jobs at other engineering firm, you know, they're, 80s, whatever, there was layoff at one point and got to fill that gap somehow. And you have the ability and you know people. So that's what you do when you're in sort of the engineering world. And he transitioned into software engineering from mechanical engineering. And so uh, there was a stopgap time. But I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, he we we've talked about it before. It's just what a lot of, you know, 
I guess what you call today a solopreneur struggle with, which is how do I do all the work and then do all the new business development and then do all the accounting and do all these things. You know, it's just, it's, it wasn't really for him. And so he had an opportunity to go back to the corporate world and he was able to do that, you know, and I, I did work at, out of college. I got hired back when you could get a job out of college. Um, <laughs> I got hired at, uh, I actually had an internship at Hallmark at the headquarters in Kansas city where I'm from. And I, I went to university of Missouri in Columbia. So the Mizzou tigers, if you like sports at all and no, other I, things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have friends it. are a big Mizzou you know, fans. Yeah. So. Mizzou. Yes. So, uh, I interned at Hallmark and then I had a, um, job straight out of college at sprint. And I chose, I actually had to offer an for SBC in St. Louis and like a management fast track. And a software engineer position at Sprint PCS uh, in Kansas City. So my parents thought I was crazy because I turned the SBC one down and I took the Sprint one because the drummer in a band that I was in at the time was in Kansas City. And so the rest of us were at Mizzou in Columbia. And so we moved, we all graduated around the same time and we moved for me back to Kansas City where I I swore I'd never go back to. went back to Kansas city. And so we could be there and be much more conducive for practicing and recording and eventually touring and that whole stuff. So, so I did that. And the sprint job was just a stop gap while I got my business, my agency off the ground. So I actually started it and I had actually had clients. Uh, I started it right at the end of college in uh, 2001. I graduated 2002. So it was like the end of 2001. I remember being in my college apartment, designing the first website branding logo this was the days of flash if you remember flash rest in hey, peace it's still around <laughs> it's yeah, in its yeah. last year it's in its last year i know year, i keep right? getting update yeah. prompts i'm like what aren't you guys dead what's going on here yeah. um so anyways yeah so we we won awards for our work in flash uh and that site was one of them and that was the first one i still remember that that room where I did that. And then I was getting, while I was working full time, I was on my lunch break. And then at night I was literally like handling new business and, you know, landing contracts and doing the work and it all started from there. You know, I didn't have any, uh, trust fund or any, you know, secret stash of cash. It was literally like my, my vision and my idea for what this could be. And, my own two hands and my knowledge set, which, you know, like I said, as a constant student, I've been evolving every single, I feel like every single day, you know, I, I studied just like my dad did. I remember my dad would, would like watch TV at night growing up and he would read books nonstop programming. Cause it's always, it's a moving target and it really is changing. And now I'm in that world because I have that, I have that tech background in addition to the creative and the marketing and brand and all that stuff and strategy but I have that tech background. So I too know that, you know, this is a moving target and it's a train that never stops and you've got to stay up on the latest thing. Cause at this point, I feel like things are exponentially more complicated than, than they were back then, you know, when you just had AOL and, you know, I was building, build, I was building websites on GeoCities. It was another one for you. Eighties, nineties, yeah. GeoCities, <laughs> rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So you started your branding company. Um, mm -hmm. what was, so what did, so I'm sure it's evolved over the years from what you did originally. Yeah. So what was the main focus in the beginning? What did you in the beginning? Because uh, there there's the story is long here, but I'll keep it short. So I actually, I started a, I started a record label in high school and part of my concept for this sort of production house was that the all the design and tech and all the music and artists it would feed itself so it would take care of itself so there was never a need to have to hire any outside design or whatever because i was very into design very into studying european creativity and design styles and trends and all this stuff and i love getting albums and i take the whole thing apart and look on you know sometimes there was a Easter egg under the jewel case, you know, you could see, I loved that, like the packaging and cassette tapes before that. And also vinyl back then to this day. Um, 
so I loved all that. And I wanted to have this production company that, so, cause I was very big into music and I was making music. And then I eventually, you know, like signed one of my friend's bands and got them charting on college radio and did all the things I know to do. Um, and so at some point I realized that at that time that music was this time and money sink, um, especially promoting bands, you know, cause I got this band all the way onto college radio and then they didn't fulfill the basic agreement that you're going to now tour. And so then it was like, okay, well we're, we're in like top 30 on all these college stations and you're not there playing. Like it doesn't work like that, you know? So, so, uh, to me, that's the business side, um, of my brain going, well, that's not going to work. So on the other hand, this design piece of this thing, which was taking off, I, you know, it was really exciting, loved it. I was like, there's so much opportunity and potential here. So I eventually split these two things apart and eventually laid the label to rest. And I took off with what became, what was a design firm. So in the very beginning, my agency that is today was a design firm. And that's what I called it. Um, and that's how I talked about it. We focused heavy, heavy on design. We did do a lot of web design. We still did heavy tech programming, database development, all that. Um, but we often started at creativity and design, which, um, now we're getting to the Edison moment. So the design and the creative at that time, because I, I was obsessed with it and I really believed that it, it matters and it does. And I still believe that to this day. It matters how you present yourself. Just like you don't show up to a nice party wearing your sloppy, you know, jean shorts with paint splattered on them. And everybody else is in a suit. First of all, you don't fit there. So you're, it's positioning. And second of all, you know, you're not, you're not at the level, you know, these people look like they're at some other level than you are. So, or you miss the memo. So same with brands and businesses, you know, that's what design and creativity is about. However, the Edison moment, one of my Edison moments in life, I think was really realizing as we continue to evolve our services suite to kind of cover, I, I kept seeing clients all having these similar problems. And I thought, well, we could help with that. We can do that. We could do that for you. But we were positioned as a, and in our own world, as a design firm. So they thought, oh, well, this isn't design or this isn't web design or this isn't branding. So I guess you guys probably don't do that. You know, I was like, no, wait, 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 we do, we can. And so eventually I worked with a mentor, um, that I really respect and he ran an agency in LA as part of how I got to LA and Southern California. Um, and he just illuminated a lot of things for me. So I think one of those Edison moments kind of encapsulating all that is realizing that all of this that we do has to start whether the business is established and rebranding repositioning or it's a new startup starting from ground zero things have to start with the strategy and the vision and that's a big part of our our brand and marketing development methodology is just that that's the whole first phase of work there's there's no creative colors design identity work, photography, anything until our third phase of our methodology. That's month three, typically in our world. So things, I, I moved the order of things around and we've just constantly refined our methodology and it's, it's pretty hardened at this point to today. Um, but that first 10 years was very formative and shifting things around. And that was a really big turning point, I think, for my, for my agency, my business, in better positioning us to help our clients and make much more powerful work. Because as I say today, it's not just about a pretty picture, you know, it's so much more to it, you know, and I feel like the strategy around how you use those pretty pictures, um, speaking metaphorically mostly, but how you use those pretty pictures is like 90% of the battle. Now I used to believe that, branding and design was, was 90% of the battle. And now I would say it's actually, it's gone the other way where vision, strategy, planning, you know, what they say like your goal should be 90% planning and 10% execution. So that's really how we do things to be ultra efficient for our clients in a, in a very complicated world of brand and marketing today. Cause when I started my agency, there was no social media. There wasn't even, there wasn't even Facebook on my college campus, um, at all. 
Um, I think they might have been piloting it, maybe. But we had Napster, so that's what that's the era I was in. Right. It Mizzou, was coming, so. it just wasn't there yet. Yeah. yeah. So, but as it came around and started to get traction, it was one of those things where we said, you know, our clients have no clue what to do with this thing, but we do. We, you know, and so, as soon as those things end up on the radar, we have to study it, watch it, monitor it. You know, we did that with TikTok kind of doing that with clubhouse right now um just you know to see like is this thing gonna be something is it gonna be the next facebook to, or replacement for facebook or is it gonna be like everybody's like oh I'm, oh my god and then it fades away you know because we don't need to go all in on that with you know our, our clients budgets so we can put that in a better place so what is your strategy on clubhouse then you brought Curious. it up because I mean, it's the biggest new shiny thing in the you know right now, yeah. and, and a lot of people are like, well, I'm so amazing. I was when the room was, you know, I'm not going to drop a name, but it's like, yeah, you were in the room. So what? Go to a conference. Yeah. You'll be in the same room with them. You know? The jury's still out here, um, but I don't really, I don't feel like audio chat rooms is is a new idea, mind blowing right. on any level, and I I kind of feel like. The thing about, again, I heard one of your older podcasts where you're talking about working from home. And so um, well, basically, thanks for, thanks for listening to them. I appreciate it. Yeah. 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 So uh, I like to kind of catch a vibe, you know, before, before we chat. So, um, but the thing about it is, yes, people can be more efficient working from home. But I, I also say, and I too, since COVID, I, basically sent everybody home that wasn't already working home. Just like, just same as you, like, just stay there. I'll come to the office, right. you know, take the computers, take it. Just, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk through Slack. We'll get on the phone. We'll do calls, whatever needs to be done. You know, like just let's, I don't want this to get more complicated. Of course it, it got more complicated because as you know, we're both in California. So I don't even know if we're, <laughs> I don't know what the rules are anymore as far as quarantine and, you know, now you can't eat inside a restaurant down the street, but the amusement park's opening. Yeah. I, I don't get yeah. it. I don't get yeah. it, but I never there, got there. The is, color. There I is no it. logic to what's going on. <laughs> there's, they say you're using the science, but I don't, I don't know what science they're using, but it's not real science. So. <laughs> right. Right. The facts are not real facts that are being followed. correct. I also don't correct. understand the color coding system in California, but that's another story. That's so, just that, what that means is us in our area, um, since we're a lot of us are overweight and all that other issues that we have more major <laughs> medical issues. So we have to stay in our houses a lot longer. Yeah, if you're yeah. down there in Southern California, where most people, you know, it's abnormal to be overweight and, you know, heavy, you know, then, you know, you don't have that same issue, but yeah, yeah. Helps keep the center of gravity lower when you're skating. <laughs> yeah, you go. Uh, but I did have a point to that. I just wanted to say that the funny thing is I feel like there's a lot of people who actually can't work from home efficiently or effectively. It's not made for most people. But of course, when we did this at first, it was like, yay, everybody's working from home. It's going to be awesome. You know, get right. cozy. And now I think the reality is because I've seen a lot of these pendulum swings over the last 20 years, you know. Um, and so... I think it, the reality is it might be cool now while you're working from home and your boss isn't over your shoulder if you work for somebody else. But when you go back to an office, because you will, um, you're not, your brain cannot, you, you know, I say multitasking is a farce. Your brain can't work efficiently and listen to Clubhouse all day. Like you right. can't listen to that at all. And if your boss sees you doing that, you're going to get fired. So, so my, my thing, it's like, is it, it's practical kind of now, but there's so many issues like privacy. I'm already seeing people writing about that and then they're not recording it. So then you can't, you have to be there in real time. And like, didn't we already kill real time broadcast television basically as an elder millennial and yeah. we specialize in the millennial generation too. So, uh, you know, we, we already killed that. So we're bringing back like real time audio. That, that's where I, it's a disconnect for me. 
Yeah. Um, so for me, I used it a lot when I was first setting up podcasting because I did radio. That was easy. I had a producer do all that and they still do that to this day. But I had to set it up at home because in March they shut the you know station down and then yeah. everything had to be. So I had to set up at home. So I had a setup. But then I wanted to do podcasts. Well, there was stuff I didn't know. And what was nice is there's three people on there. They had a different thing all every time they were doing it, and they would talk about podcasting and how to set up your stuff. So for me, it was great. But now I have all the notifications turned off. I never go on oh, there, oh you know, gosh. because the notifications um, were yeah. obnoxious, yeah. unbelievable. So for, unbelievable. For, so for me, it served a purpose in the beginning for what I wanted, but I only, I'm like, I'm going to go read done and I don't want to go, you know, it's not for me. Yeah. I don't like to be on Facebook. I don't like to be on LinkedIn. I don't, that's not my thing. My thing is I, I talk to people. That's what I do all day long in my business mm-hmm. and, in, and now doing this. That's what I like to do. So back to yeah. you since we're about you and not me. And it's funny because, you know, we're 25 minutes into this and you said you couldn't talk. You're right. You've been talking the whole time, right? You're like, oh, oh yeah. I don't think I'll be able to, you know, can you ask me questions? Because you're, you're a natural. Anyway, so it's not, all right. So you've changed 20 years of business. Things change drastically. Um, I mean, technology changes so much faster now. So everything yeah. changes faster now and you have to stay on top of it. So would you say that today versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I mean, it's so you got, you, you can't rest. I, I feel like in my business, things change so much still with what we're doing. You can't, there's not the time that we used to be able, Oh, we got time. We can get to that. There is none of that time. Do you feel that way mm-hmm. in your industry to stay on yeah, top? I, I do. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like there's this sort of idea that things can, you know, from a, your average the people out there who maybe want to talk to us about, you know, engaging our agency, sometimes there's this feeling of it can just all happen overnight. Oh, you know, you can just, I heard somebody say recently uh, something to the effect of, you know, I mean, I can make a site on Wix in like five minutes, you know? So it's like, well, that's not what we do here. We're normally building like custom, you know, total custom tech, everything, because our clients are usually, you know, their, their lifestyle startups are disruptive. You know, we don't just go grab like WordPress or Wix off the shelf and slam it in and we're, we're good, you know? So, but there's a misconception because people see, you know, GoDaddy and Wix advertising like, oh, look, you can make your site in five minutes, but that's not a, that's just a HTML page at the end of the day. So, so yeah, things are constantly accelerating now we have the right now it really is the clash of the titans between and all of us marketers and you know any brand marketing person uh out there should be feeling the effects of the google and facebook and apple this whole privacy war that's going on and it's costing us all a lot of time and in the gray hair Um, so that's just making things more complicated and taking away from sometimes moving the ball for us, like trying to figure out what the heck these guys want us to do. Where, where are we supposed to stand guys, you know, and everybody's caught in the middle while these guys are, it's like those trans, the end of the transformers movies where there's just, there's, it's like a 25 minute long battle between all these huge robots. And that's kind of what it feels like. Um, so, so yeah, everything I think has, feels like it's, it's, constantly accelerated for the last uh 20 years especially in the you know so i i call it the brand and marketing universe and we have this big chart that we've kept where we keep adding like all these circles it's sort of like a molecule you know and it like does its thing and expands multiplies kind of looks like that so so yeah it's it's complicated to say the least (laughs) sorry i have some noise around here so i apologize uh my studio is next to the elevator they never use it because no one's been in this building forever right so for uh, yeah. covid but all of a sudden it has to be going right now uh yeah. so i noticed on your website you guys do you said you business to consumer startups is, is that mm-hmm. what you focus on more now or is that just part of what you do or is that basically what you're so over yeah good question so over 20 years um we've definitely worked with b2b clients uh as well as b2c and we really focused on when we repositioned as an agency and I went through a pretty, you know, big turn to better position from design firm to really like what, what we're doing now is so much bigger than the design firm. And I didn't 
quite know how to make that turn. And that's, that was about the time I started working with a mentor um, who had run a successful agency and kind of figured out that, <coughs> excuse me, figured out that we were already doing all these things. It's just a positioning issue where we weren't talking about the company, you know, we're saying like design firm, but that's like 15% of what we're doing. We're doing all this other stuff. So, um, so at the end of the day, you know, when we repositioned, we really, I looked back at all of the work we had done, stuff we'd won awards for, stuff we hadn't won awards for. And what really excited me and my team, and even though the team obviously changes over the years, there's a constant thread of people who are big, big fans of culture and they're tuned in. And that's one of the big things, um, especially on the creative side and brand strategy, just being focused on culture and lifestyle. And so when we had to kind of pick a spot. I felt like B to C and now D to C has become kind of the next version of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, B to C, D to C lifestyle brands, challenger brands, startups really is what we know the best and we do the best. Um, we can do B to B. We've done huge things in B to B space. I wouldn't not look at it today, but I think what's exciting to us is the challenges that our our ability to harness and understand we have a lot of deep expertise in the millennial generation um so to help and that's a big part of what most of our clients are after is the millennial generation but they don't understand it um still to this day so we're able to help kind of connect all the pieces together that way i'm so. sorry does anybody really understand them <laughs> and I don't mean that wrong because I got kids in that generation, right? So yeah, you know. I'm, yeah. I'm a as a child of the '80s. I am a uh, I'm an elder millennial, but there is a lot of uh, derivation along the spectrum, and we immediately divide the younger half and the older half as two separate. I mean, they probably should have been called two different generations. If we're, we're being just, honest, they were just lazy, but, I guess. Yeah, those yeah. generational people, Pew, right. the Pew Research Institute. <laughs> talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on your business to consumer or, or direct to consumer setup, <clears throat> do you, what do you handle that? Do you, I mean, do you set up from, all right, so this is the way your business you want to start. Do you help them all the way through from a to what, I mean, what do you do for say, say I came yeah. to you and I wanted to start, I was starting a business to consumer for millennials. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, we, we do start from ground zero from the big idea. So our, our typical client, uh, would come in. He's he or she's got an amazing. They've got this idea that they've been thinking about. They've probably had some some success in their in their life in corporate world or other businesses that they started that have gone well. Um, but they have this one thing that they really want to go after, and they they know that they don't know how to get it from point A to point Z. So we would basically talk discuss about that idea. You know all that you've thought through and figure out what you haven't. And then basically, you know, our senior team comes alongside you and we start to work through and really develop that big idea from, because it really is often very, very foggy, blue sky, kind of the seed, but then really flesh it out, you know, do audience, unique buying tribe, definition, strategy, your messaging, all these things. It's like, I liken it to building a pyramid, you know? So we're building this big, the big strategy layer is the foundational, super important. And each, each step of the methodology, we build a smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to put that last one on top, that last triangle piece to the point of the pyramid. And, you know, and we do it in a really capital efficient way, um, you know, too, because I've, I've, we've had clients have come in who've, who've literally blown over a hundred thousand dollars and have nothing to show for it because they try to do it themselves. They thought, Oh, I'm going to, I got this idea. I'm going to go hire a programmer. Okay. Well you, you need to have requirements. Someone has to write the requirements on the technical side. Then you have to have testing and QA and you also have to have people to manage programmers because they need to be managed. Um, you know, they're very powerful, but you gotta, you, you know, you gotta, direct them and be clear and you got to know. And because I have a, actually have a computer science degree, I know how to communicate with them because I've worked with them. I've been that guy, but I also can speak to my creative team 
and I know how to speak design and color and, you know, deal with that and kind of bridge the two. So, so that's, it's a, you know, it's a typically a six month long process to go from idea to market. And when I sum it up, I say we build, launch and grow startups. So we would build that startup from A to Z. Um, then you're ready to go to market. So we launch it and then we manage all the advertising, all the spending that goes in there, the marketing, the strategy, taking that all that messaging we developed in the beginning, implementing it in all the different channels from PPC ads to social media. And at the end of the day, growing that startup towards our key KPIs. So it can't just be like, okay, cool, we're out there, you know, we're spending money, we're getting likes on posts. Like, it's not like that. You know, it's, it's like, you got to build customer traction, especially if you're a startup founder and you want to go raise outside capital outside of your own. That's not for everybody. And it's definitely becomes a one way street when you go that way. But regardless, we got to build that customer traction so that we can show if you want to, you could show potential investors down the road, like, look, we did this and with, you know, five, $10,000 of advertising spending, let's say a month, we were able to accomplish X, Y, Z. And then we can tie that back. So that's such and such per cost of, you know, lifetime value and customer acquisition costs and all that stuff. So we set up our startup founder clients so that they can have those conversations and have them effectively. And these are things that we think about from day one, even though you as the startup founder, unless you've been through it before, or you're a super smart guy, you probably didn't think about those things. So you're, it's all very efficient and methodical and, you know, we're, we're heading in a direction and we do it together. So huge difference between the two different millennial groups, what they think about when you, when you're marketing to them. Um, I, I really think so. I do. Uh, I think the, you know, we, we usually have a little bit heavier focus on the older half which then kind of bleeds in, you know, it's, it's never just about millennials, you know, it's, it's, there's still Gen X, sometimes there's baby boomers, um, you know, and so you got to plan accordingly, you got to plan creative, what are we showing them? What are we saying? How do we say it authentically? Um, and then the, I think the younger half and the older half just differ a lot in that the younger half definitely are digitally native. I mean, they've just grown up, you know, or whatever my kid's generation is going to be, it's going to be even more hyper accelerated. I mean, I, I kid you not. I took a little video of my son, my three-year-old today, cause he built this amazing thing. He just, he's like little Einstein. Uh, he just sits there and turn around and you turn back around. And he's built this like giant castle. And my five-year-old does the same thing. Um, they're not, not raising hell, you know, um, while you are looking at them. So he built this thing. So I took this a little video of him and then the, and I kid you not this, this little three-year-old, my little three-year-old Nico, he says, uh, and like my video on YouTube. And I'm just like, <laughs> I don't, can't. Yeah. And I don't can't. forget to su- subscribe while you're at it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. So it's just, it's a, it's a brave new world, you know? Right. No, I just, you know, because for myself, one of the things that I, in our industry, right, during 2006 on, a lot of people lost their homes, right? So a lot of kids, yeah. that generation that you were talking about, saw their parents lose their house and they think it's not important to own a home. And most, and my big thing about getting the word out for the way I was doing it was because the only way to build personal wealth for most people is through home ownership. And it's, you know, we're in a country that subsidizes the mortgages so that you can own a home, right? There's no other country that does the, the stuff that we do when it comes to mortgages. So, and that's, I was trying to always get that word out, but I think one of the things I'm failing for some of them, right? Some parents are saying, okay, listen to this program because it's there, but I'm not saying they're on talk radio, right? They're not there. They mm-hmm. might be somewhere else, but their parents are still there. Their grandparents are there and they're telling them, what would you be, what would you recommend somebody like myself who's trying to get to the reach to those people. Mm-hmm. I don't want, I don't want to get away from, you know, without paying you. I'm just, you know, quick little snippet, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you know for, I mean? for recorded audio in a, in a show like this, uh, or your, your other show is about my other shows on right? air, the other shows about mortgages and, and owning a home buying. That's all it's about weekly about that. We talk about first time yeah. home buyers, how you're able to do it. And we get a huge traction. Don't be wrong. We, 40% of our business is coming from it right now. But I would I, I would just say my initial thought 
I don't know what the mechanics of the station that that's on, but I would say you have to get that content um, into the digital world. Right. So you've got to get that that as its podcast. Get that on. We did. And if you do, forgive me because I don't. I don't no, know. no, we did. We, on the, I didn't tell you about that one. Yeah. So oh. you, when I first started it, I'm like, how do I use this more than just airwaves, right? Because I knew that's 51 and older. That's not that generation. So we turned it into a podcast on Monday, right? And so that's Good. out there and that's getting traction, but it's just getting more of that information out to people, you know, and I have people who cut yeah. it up, put it on, t- you know, going to start doing stuff on TikTok, and they're doing stuff elsewhere. I'm just trying to make sure that we reach those people. And it's not so much, I'm trying to reach them to make money off them. I want that word out there. So they know that they should do that. Yeah. You know? I would think TikTok would skew a little too young for who you're after. I mean, that's, we're talking Gen Z mostly there, but Definitely chopping it up and making, you know, uh, you know, edibles, as we like to call it, make little edible uh, things. Hey, and we're in California, those you got to be careful. Saying that word. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, you're going to get a bunch of money from CBD and all the ad traffic, I'm sure, after the show. So uh, anyways, so getting that content in in short format and getting it out on places like Instagram, um, Facebook, of course, is going to be more of a 40 and up crowd at this point, but it's not to say, I don't know what your, your demographics you're after. We, we would call unique buying tribes, you know, who's the number one and the number two, that's where we would start and then figure out, okay, we need to get content here, here, and here, because those unique buying tribes hang out here and here, you know? So gotcha. if you're after millennials, I wouldn't say, oh, obviously you need to go to TikTok. I yeah. disagree with that. Um, now, if you said, I want to reach you know, 16 year olds right now, then I would say, oh my gosh, you need to go to TikTok. You know, if you said, I want to reach a technophile music lover, 30, 35, or maybe they're also a venture capitalist, then I would say, go to Twitter, you know? So just, it's all that strategy defines what you do here, but getting it out and then putting ad spend, I would put some boost, some ad spend behind these things and set up audiences that match who you're thinking about you know because right. we could even there's a lot of unique nuances having grown up in the midwest and owned two houses in my lifetime in kansas city but never owning one in in california because the prices are are exponentially higher you know and as a millennial if i'm if i'm born with that idea which i i have been um it's like how do how do you get to that i mean how do you afford a house that's like average house price at least down here is like eight hundred thousand dollars unless you're going to live inland you know and i mean I live, why live why live down there then right it, yeah i mean yeah <laughs> Escond- exactly. you want to live like, and you want to live in escondido and say you live in san no, diego no no Fall no if i'm gonna do no. that i'll i'll just move to texas or something if i'm doing that well, aren't you, know? you guys going to be moving your company eventually anyway for tax <laughs> strategies? <laughs> no, no, I don't have any plans for that. I don't have any plans for that. I, I, there was a time, there was a time where it was very serious about uh, relocating everything to Austin, but I'm glad that didn't happen either because that was pre-COVID, and I hear you know a lot of people leaving like the Bay, San Francisco, you know, heading places like that, and Austin on the receiving end is. Is, there's no room there. They're, they're not built for that. All these no. companies are like, we're going to Austin. Elon Musk, we're taking Tesla to Houston. Or I don't remember where he said he's going to Texas. Uh, actually, he, is, he did say he was going to Austin, didn't he? I think so. I don't remember. I feel but, like everybody, and, you know, there's no... Everybody says we're out of here. That. And the problem yeah. with that is, right, I mean, a lot of people moved out of the Bay Area up to where we are and up in the foothills to be away because they could remotely, right? I'm like, this is mm-hmm. a three-year play, right? Everybody's yeah. out the first year. The second year, everybody's like, okay, we need to start coming back into the office because we can't work the same as we were at right. home. We can't collaborate. We're, you know, the Zoom's okay, but you can't just do the same as if you're in the same building. All right. And then right. the third year, every, you know, you st- that part of that, everybody's back doing it. Now they're commuting going, okay, I'm done. I'm selling my house. I'm moving back to the Bay, right? So I'm right. like, this is a three-year thing. It's, it's going to increase values no matter what happens. But if you want to buy a house down there, let me know. I can tell you how to do it. All right. Okay. So okay. It's not that difficult. The issue is just, I mean, especially with the rates as low as they've been. I mean, there's no well, reason that's the not part to. I, that's yeah. the part I get that's great. It's just, you know, inventory is low and it's and, at low uh, everywhere. 
Yeah. Yeah. Low everywhere. And then you got here, you got people coming. I don't know where they're from Orange County or something. Just uh, from what I hear, they come in cash. They got cash offers. Right. And that's no, they, gonna... they have that everywhere. I mean, cash offers everywhere. Yeah. It's like, where are you getting this cash from? Oh, I'm selling my house in the Bay Area and I have 10 people behind me trying to buy my house and I'm and they're doing <laughs> 100 to 200,000 over asking at 1.7 million. And you know that's just a shack uh, just a regular house like in Oceanside that's not that big right. of a deal, right? So Right. Yeah, so Crazy. Yeah, um, you know, a lot to think about because I, you know, I didn't know where we're going to go today. We're at 45 minutes and you said you wouldn't talk much if I could ask you a lot of questions. <laughs> and I think you're I underestimate how much information you have and knowledge to give. Um, so I really appreciate um, what Absolutely. you gave today. And you said your one Edison moment earlier in the show, was there a second one or a third one that you had that you wanted to share? Oh, um, they just so many of them. There, there are, there's yeah. definitely more than one. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that that was really the the biggest one from what we were discussing right. today in our, our journey. I mean, I think the other, others are, are certainly secondary. Right. But there's one um, more thing I want to bring up. So we'll forget that. All right. Okay. Uh, so you're talking about mentor, right? Coach, mm -hmm. whatever you call them. Um, because I don't know, you listen to some of them, and what, and a lot of theme that I've found with talking to business owners and entrepreneurs as you're building, it's lonely at the top, right? So you yes, need to be in, in a group that are like minded individuals who own companies, or and so that you can under ask people questions, right? Hey, this happened to me, this happened to that, and I didn't realize that concept till I was when I used to be down there at a, in a co uh, mortgage company, and it was a pretty big mortgage company. I helped them grow it. And he had no friends, right? He had nobody he, and he would try to take out people at the company. And it's like, you can't do that. That's not who you want to be with, right? You need to mm -hmm. go find other people who are doing what you've done or in other industries so that you can learn from them. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I made a, I did what you said just made me think about, you know, the first 10 years of, of my business, I, I've said this to many people before, like, I feel like I made almost every mistake that you can make. It's probably not true. I mean, you know, um, but I made a lot of mistakes and things like, you know, thinking one thing that is a great quote that I heard was, and it was actually, this came from my mentor was, you know, you don't, you run a business, not an orphanage because I had this whole idea. I think I had a lot of disappointment in the first, you know, when I started to add people and hire people, where people will come in, I think, oh, okay, like I, he's, he's a moldable ball of clay. I can make him, I can turn him into, you know, I will groom him to be this amazing designer program or whatever, whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, I often found myself disappointed in who I picked, you know, I've don't, I've never had any partners or anything as far as the business. And so who I decided to pick. And sometimes I even, I had to rush a hire because I was trying to hire too fast, you know? And so you get somebody and then you just like, man, it's like, it's like buying a car. And it's like, I thought this was a V8, <laughs> right. you know? And it's like, you slamming the gas and it's like, it's moving like a four cylinder, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. And then it takes off, you know, like it's that kind of stuff. So I, that was something I learned too. That was another Edison moment. And the idea of, I think this is an entrepreneur flaw. Um, of hiring people that, you know, you want to hire people and surround yourself with team that are better than you, not like subservient to you. And I've seen some clients that do that where they, everybody is beneath them as far as uh, their understanding level and they will always remain there, you know? So that's something I figured out was, oh, when I bring in people who are, I, I want people, I say, I'm happy to be wrong. I want to be wrong. Cause then that means I didn't have to be the guy who was always right. You know, it's right. often, it often happens, but, uh, I don't, I'm happy to be wrong because then I learned something too, you know? And so, so that's something too, I think is a, another Edison moment in my life was just, you know, bringing in people and, and whatever you're in. And you mentioned mastermind groups is like, is a great tie into that. Like surrounding yourself with people who've been there, They've done that in whatever their field of focus is and mastermind groups, which um, my mentorship did lead to then a couple different mastermind groups with the same people that had worked with the coach or the, the, the mentor. Um, and those are great. Those are some of the best, most pivotal times, um, 
making that decision to engage a mentor, first of all, and then making those decisions to get into the mastermind groups too, was absolutely pivotal in my business to get it where it is today, to even be in business 20 years later, especially after all that we've been through, especially uh, all, all, I guess it's three kind of economic blips things that have happened. (laughs) It's not a blip, but I guess an earthquake, tsunami, whatever the downturns, you know, that have happened since I, I started my, my agency. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I have, you know, shout out to, to Peleg, uh, for all the wisdom. So Kurt, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You know, um, they can, uh, they can go to our website and go to the contact section. Our main agency emails there. You could email me directly. Um, our site is at hype life brands.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Kurt C U R T. And my last name again, C U S C I N O. Um, you can just look up Kurt hype life as well, and you'll find me there and you can reach out to me directly. Uh, if you hit up our site at hypelifebrands.com, there's a chat on the site. Um, and I've made it a, a kind of a personal practice, a mission to actually, I, I feel those things, uh, when I'm not doing 15 other things, but I, so you can actually talk to me right there and we'll set up a time to get on an actual phone and, and have a real conversation, but you can get to me directly there. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I think phone's very important. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we use we text, we use that. and I'll, it's like, no, pick up the phone. It's like, I emailed yeah. them, no, pick up yeah. the phone. Yeah, yeah, forget that. You know, what I mean, it's like, yeah, email. You know, how many I get, emails yeah. I get in a day? Six, like, I, like I, everybody else, yeah, I got 600. And they're like, did you see that email? I say, no, my staff, don't <laughs> send it through that, send it through these other systems we have, or right. just or right. walk in my office and say, hey, <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah, the old yes, way. Conversations. Yeah. The, the, we're, we're a relationship, uh, you know, we're big on building relationships. I'm big on that. We're a relationship business. And, and I think that's one of the big things that's been part of how Hype Life's been successful. And I've been able to get to where I am today is just like attention to that, you know, like don't know. Yeah. Cause like just what you said, don't text me. Now, if you're a client, a lot of clients, they can, they have my personal cell phone in the, because we, we have camaraderie. Like if I can't have a beer with you or a drink or a coffee or whatever, you're, we're probably not going to take on the work. That's one of my rules too, for sanity. You know, like uh, Steve Sims, I brought up, right. That's his chug mm-hmm. test. If you can't have a beer with somebody, you don't hire them and you don't ha- you do any work with them as a client. If you can't have a yeah. beer, with them, that's his chug test. So you really should check him out. He's He's got me to you. Yeah. He got me to you through Todd. So, um, okay. He has a a book blue fishing. Um, so Steve Sims, Steve D Sims is his name. And he just thinks about things differently. And he, he, I met him a long time ago in my industry, but he's not from my industry. So it was really nice talking to him about how you figured things out and and that right there. I mean, and make things ugly. Don't be worried about it. It has to be perfect. Just get it done. Mm -hmm. You know, communicate. Um, because one of the things for, for me is, you know, I text, I, I, I have my clients, they can text me, but if they text me, I'm calling them and they, I'm like, yeah. sorry, I, I, I don't, do, it's going to take me longer to type this than to be able to hear your tones and inflections in your voice and know what you're really saying. And so there's no problem. Right. 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 Absolutely. That, yep. that, hey, and that's, I think one of the things that the younger generation needs to pick back up, pick up your phone. Because I know you're on it because you were just texting me two seconds ago when I called you, son. <laughs> right? Pick up your phone. <laughs> listen to voicemails. Leave a voicemail. Let's move on. But, you know, that's yeah, just. Yeah, I'm, I've got a three and a five year old, and uh, I don't, you know, I love tech and all these things, but it, it's a, it feels like an uphill battle and trying to manage screen time because we didn't have that growing up, just this like, you know, it's like everywhere. Like my son's in virtual kindergarten, you know, so he's already on the, he's already on a computer all day, especially because of COVID. And then it's like, we wanted to get him off. Like we need him to go outside and ride his bike or, you know, just like balancing that's tough for the us older millennial parents and up, you know, uh, into, you know, Gen X parents. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. So we'll see. All right, Kurt, I really appreciate you showing up today and being on my podcast. Uh, it was really a nice time talking with you. 